uh, most of the people are here. Yeah. So why don't we start? Yeah. Well, hi everyone, I'm John Roberts. I'm a managing director of ABS Capital Solutions. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're excited to uh, present the dynamics and economics of Israel's venture finance financing ecosystem, a unique opportunity for American firms. Now today we have um, uh, two presenters. We have uh, Brian Rosenzweig, who's a managing partner at Jan Janvest Capital, and Stan Feldman, who's the chief valuation officer at ABS Capital Solutions, which is an affiliate of Axiom Valuation Solutions. And these are the topics that we'll be looking at today. Brian is going to help us out with Israeli tech market macroeconomics. Um, he's going to talk about how Israel became a tech powerhouse. And then he's going to give a micro view of is Israel's tech ecosystem. And Stan is going to discuss the new Middle East and what it means for the acquisition of Israeli tech startups by US strategic acquirers. So just to, I have just a couple housekeeping issues to talk about. We, we will be recording this uh, webinar. And so we'll send to all the attendees a, a, an email with a link to the webinar. And secondly, we'll, t we'll cover all the uh, questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question, on the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Click on that, type in your questions, and we'll get to that at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Take it away, Brian. Sure, one second, let me see what we got here. Share screen. All right, can you, everyone see? Can you guys see the screen? Yep. All right, great. So Stan and John, thanks for including me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, again, my name is Brian Rosenzweig. I'm, a, uh, I'm the Atlanta-based partner at Janvest Capital. Um, just a brief uh, overview on us, just to provide some context here. We're an institutional seed fund, which over the last decade has been investing in enterprise-grade deep technologies being developed in Israel, but commercialized here in the United States. Um, at present, we are deploying out of four funds or have, have, have uh, are currently operating, I should say, four funds. Uh, we have about 80 million under management, three offices, one in New York, I'm in Atlanta, and we have an office in Tel Aviv. Um, we've made 27 investments, soon to be 28 over the last uh, nine, nine or so years. Um, and our focus areas are really where we believe Israeli entrepreneurs have a competitive advantage abroad, which is in cybersecurity, data analytics, connectivity, cloud infrastructure, business intelligence, software production, and gener general enterprise software. So in other words, B2B enterprise-grade technologies, this is where we believe, uh, again, Israeli entrepreneurs have, a, have an advantage. And that's where we have and will continue to, uh, to, to focus. Um, so in this presentation, I kind of want to just briefly touch on both the macro and the micro economics of Israel's technology market. For most of you, I'm sure you 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 at least know of Israel um, for for some of its technology output. There's a lot of uh, you know Israel has the third highest number of publicly traded companies on American exchanges. Um, a lot of those companies are tech driven, whether it's Fiverr, Wix, um, uh, or, or, or Checkpoint. Um, and so you know Israel really is a has emerged over the last 20 or so years as one of the most dynamic technology markets in the world. And I want to offer a very brief glimpse into what that what that means from a numbers standpoint. So let's just briefly start on on the macroeconomics. So so Israel allocates more, uh, the highest percentage of, of GDP to research and development of any country in the world. It's about four and a half percent. Most of that money manifests itself in, in, in investments in early stage technology businesses, which I can touch on in a little bit. Um, but uh, it, it, is, it is certainly an achievement to, to be allocating such a high percentage of its GDP to research and development. This certainly acts as a major catalyst of innovation in Israel. Um, half of Israel's exports are high-tech products and services. Um, as a tech powerhouse, um, Israel attracts a significant amount of venture capital. Um, if you look at the fourth bullet down, it, Israel is the first in terms of the uh, in terms of the amount of venture capital invested per person or per capita. Uh, in Israel, it's $175 per person, whereas here in the U.S., it's about $75 per person. So uh, over three times as much venture capital invested per capita uh, in Israel as, as is here in the U.S. Um, 
Israel is also, in, in addition to uh, uh, being a technology powerhouse, Israel is the epicenter for cybersecurity technologies. Over 20% of all venture capital dollars globally go towards uh, cybersecurity venture investments, go towards Israeli companies, which is pretty impressive, given that this is a country of eight and a half million people, of which only about 300,000 or so are employed in high tech. So, uh, you know, punching way above its weight class in terms of, uh, of, of technology out output, both in terms of quantity and quality. Um, and since uh, over the last decade or so, about $200 billion in transactional value has been created for, uh, for investors through Israel's high-tech market. So there's just a couple of data points from, from a macro standpoint. Now, the question always comes up, you know, how did Israel get here? It didn't just, you know, pop out of the desert and become this technology powerhouse that it is today. There's a couple of factors that play into, uh, uh, into Israel's um, tech prowess, if you will. The first of which, and I'll cover this on the left here, um, these are some of the insignias from uh, the intelligence units in Israel's military. So as, as many of you probably know, Israel has mandatory conscription. The largest unit in the Israeli military is its intelligence gathering unit. This is its cyber warfare unit known as 8200. Within 8200 or, 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 or other units, there are other cyber warfare or elite cyber warfare units. And so you think about 18 to 21 year olds receiving military grade training in cyber warfare uh, and, and what they can do with that training once they roll out of the military and apply that training to the private sector. So the military is a tremendous catalyst for Israeli innovation. You've also got the Israeli Innovation Authority. This is part of where some of that four and a half percent of GDP goes. Um, this is a program that essentially uh, invests in early stage startups in Israel and gives some of those founders the initial capital they need to get their businesses off the ground. Um, you also have the Ministry of Education. Israel has a, uh, a very tech-centric, very tech-facing uh, uh, um, institution of institutions of higher education. Uh, you've got the Technion in Haifa, which is Israel's MIT. Um, you've got the University of, uh, of Haifa. You've got Tel Aviv University, Ben-Gurion University, the Negev Hebrew University, um, and, 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 and the list goes on. All very tech-centric, very tech-oriented institutions of higher education. And then finally, over here on the right, you'll see Google and Microsoft, Verizon, SAP. Um, you've got the presence of multinational corporations. Over 400 multinational corporations are conducting intensive R&D in Israel. 200 of those companies, or 200 or so of those companies, um, come from the U.S. So companies like Google, companies like Microsoft, Verizon, and, and the list goes on. So all of this contributes to, uh, and it very much it, it, to Israel's um, tech capabilities. Um, so from there, let's dive into the microeconomics briefly. So again, we're talking about a country of eight and a half million people. Of the, within that, within such a small country, of almost 7,000 active technology companies. And without going point by point, uh, you know, new company formation in Israel has exploded. It's growing at about 100% year over year. Um, to match the increase in the number of new companies being formed in Israel, you have venture capital that is just exploding in Israel, both from domestic venture funds, but also from foreign venture funds. Um, from 2013 to 2018, the amount of venture capital invested in Israel jumped from about two billion to almost five billion. I think this year or 2020 was close to seven or eight billion. So the numbers are are, are exponentially increasing year over year to match the uh, uh, quantity and again the quality of innovation coming out of Israel. Um, you have more than 430 venture investors that have a presence in Israel. Of those 430 investors, about 25% are foreign investors like us at Janvest. But you also have name brand investors from Silicon Valley, like Battery Ventures. Um, you've got also got Excel. You've got Andreessen Horowitz. There's a lot of folks that are making investments uh, in Israel, some with, permanent some with a permanent presence, some that do not, but all uh, venture capitalists um, are, are looking at Israel today as a place to, to potentially deploy capital. Um, as I mentioned, you've got a lot of multinationals that are conducting R&D in Israel. Almost 200 of those are from the U.S. Um, and just to give you a sense for, for, for how big Israel's tech market is, you know, from a, from a, from a number standpoint, an annual basis, just from Q1 to Q3 of last year, over 438 deals were executed um, uh, tech deals, of course, that reflects almost seven and a half billion dollars of invested capital. That's a 24% increase in the amount of venture capital invested in Israel over 2019. 
Um, much of that capital is being directed at later stage growth stage deals where some of the bigger venture funds can write some bigger, bigger dollars. Um, but for us as a seed fund, that creates a lot of opportunity uh, from 2018, from 2018 and 2019 to 2020. Um, there was almost a 60 percent decline in the number of early stage deals that were executed in Israel. So for early stage funds, uh, I, I would say the, 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 it, there is more of uh, more opportunity, less competition, better valuations, which we'll certainly talk, talk about in, in just a little bit. So that's sort of the micro view. Um, of all of these, you know, 6,000 some odd startups, uh, 6, 000, almost 7,000 startups, 5,300 of them, almost 80% are enterprise solutions. So these are B2B technologies. That's not to say that Israel is not a great place to source and invest in consumer focused technologies, but generally speaking, the military training that these engineers receive um, are, 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 are most applicable, uh, that training is most applicable to the enterprise sector, to B2B technologies. Um, and so IT and enterprise software receives the bulk of venture capital um, that's being invested in, in Israel. So you've got other sectors as well, I should mention, life sciences, communications, clean tech, semiconductors, which also, which also um, attract a fairly healthy portion of venture capital uh, in Israel. Um, the latest phenomenon out of Israel is that companies are staying private longer. The big knock on Israel's tech market historically has been that companies sell too early. And, and while the average price uh, uh, at M&A for most Israeli companies is relatively low, and I'll talk about that in a second, you do have a growing trend of companies that want to stay private longer, they want to grow into higher value, they want to uh, achieve higher valuations, and ultimately create more, more multiples for their investors. Um, and here's just a, a sampling, really just a sampling um, of companies in, in the last year or so, uh, I'd say even more than a year, last 18 months or so, that have achieved, you know, uh, $500 million plus valuations. Um, perhaps the one that you'll know most, uh, uh, the one that you've seen perhaps in the news the most is this company Lemonade, which just went public. I believe it was on NASDAQ um, earlier in 2020. So really some fantastic companies growing into growth stage businesses, attracting not just venture capital, but private equity dollars as uh, uh, traditional private equity dollars as well. So really exciting stuff. But again, the average price point for most M&A in Israel is below $70 million. And so that, that begs the question, um, at least from our standpoint, you know, if you manage multi-hundred million dollar funds, how do you make money in a, in a market where the average price per point associated with an M&A is about 62, 63 million bucks? And so if you look at perform for performance wise and statistically speaking, the seed funds, the early stage funds in Israel outperform the growth stage funds by a significant margin, given their ability to create multiples, not only at the big 500, 600, 700 million dollar price points, but also at the 60, 70 million dollar price points. And so what the lesson, the lesson here uh, in association with this price point is that most tech, most uh, large acquirers of Israeli technology companies are not looking for whole companies, they're looking for pieces of technology that they can roll into their future products and services or next generation of products and services, I should add. Um, in terms of M&A, the U.S. plays a critical role. The U.S.-based US companies, U.S.-based enterprises are responsible for almost 80% of all mergers and acquisitions uh, in Israel. And if you look at the companies that are valued at $100 million or more, um, the, most, the bulk of those companies um, have their management teams in the United States. So what we call a hybrid scenario where you have your R&D in Israel and you have your management team, your CEO, your COO, your sales and marketing all in the United States. And for the companies that have achieved $100 million plus valuation, 65% of those businesses have that hybrid structure where they have their management team or the bulk of their management team in the U.S. Um, and so with that, uh, I, I think uh, it would be great to hand the mic over to, to Stan and John to talk more about, about valuations. Great. Thank Hi. you, Brian. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Brian. Thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, my name is Stan Feldman. Uh, I'm uh, Chief Valuation Officer uh, at ABS, and which is a subsidiary of uh, of Axiom Valuation Solutions. Uh, just a, a quick bio of who ABS is. Uh, we offer solutions um, or offer a unique portfolio of services to mid-market firms 
They're looking to acquire a position themselves for a capital infusion or a direct sale. What sets us apart, and this is really critical, I think, is our ability to value a firm in terms of its unique assets and then show clients how these unique attributes can be uh, leveraged in either a sale or establishing uh, an acquisition price. I think the thing that, that, uh, that most investors, buyers and sellers forget for the moment in the, in the process of going through transactions is that transactions are, really, uh, are not really a zero sum game, uh, but if done correctly, it creates value for both buyers and sellers. Um, the topic I'll address today is why mid-sized American firms should consider investing or acquiring Israeli tech startups. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Brian. Had, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Brian had mentioned um, you know large companies like Microsoft, a SAP, and so on, but there are large numbers of uh, mid-sized companies that are in the tech space <clears throat> that haven't really focused as much as they should on Israeli tech. Now, and, and here's the reason: the simple answer is is that the Israeli startup ecosystem is really a lot like or an extension of the U.S. ecosystem. However, unlike U.S. startups or early stage firms, Israeli firms look to the U.S. to achieve scale very early in their development. Uh, at least that's been the history because the internal market, as Brian had mentioned, is eight and a half million people and it's basically very small. So there's a, a market synergy, so to speak, a link between technology and the need to commercialize quickly that offers U.S. acquirers a unique path to capture technology that would be very expensive to develop on their own, or in some cases, almost impossible to develop on their own. <clears throat> now, this last point <clears throat> is underscored in a recent survey of Israeli entrepreneurs. And they were, uh, they were asked, what are the key uh, driving factors in your decision to expand to the, the US? And the two critical responses are shown above are access to customers, scale, and access to strategic partners. Access to capital, uh, interestingly enough, is far less important than creating market presence. The recognition offers a tremendous opportunity for US firms, it seems to me, uh, not named Google or Microsoft to take advantage of developments in the Israeli tech sector. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this opportunity is made greater since Israel's tech startups are generally undervalued relative to the US counterparts. Now, this is not to say that multiples haven't expanded. I think uh, Brian has mentioned that they have, but the question is they've also expanded in the US. So the relative difference between the two, uh, which, which I refer to or is often referred to as the Israeli discount uh, still remains, though it's pretty clear to me when we do more work, when we've done a lot of work on this is that the discount is starting to narrow. Um, in point of, in uh, the, the research, which, which underscores what we call the Israeli discount, was done by S Cube. And I think a lot of the work that they've done certainly suggests that the discount is not something that's uh, a point in time, but it's been, uh, it's been with us for, for a very, very long time. So the first question I think investors ask is why this is the case. Uh, the first, keep in mind that the discount means that you can buy, per, perhaps uh, purchase or acquire uh, some Israeli technology um, at a lower price point than you would for an equivalent uh, technology in the U.S. But the question is, why does this discount, discount occur, particularly in a, in a, in a global marketplace um, uh, that we're operating in now? Now, the fact is shown in the slide that you're looking at, the historical reasons for this discount, and there may be idiosyncratic reasons as well, but the two are instability <clears throat> being the most important. Now, while the pandemic has created more instability, the degree of uncertainty has diminished globally and vaccine development and expectation that over the next 12 months, the global economy will return to some level of normalcy. Which, with this kind of things reduced uh, kind of you know, systematic global instability. But th that affects all nations, uh, all industries. But, but, this positive, but this positive impact, as I noted, affects all firms. And the one factor that has changed is a significant reduction in regional instability, predominantly associated 
with the Abraham Accords and the normalization between Israel and its Arab neighbors. But the question is, is why is this, is this happening now? Now, these accords did not just happen. They were not the result of the Trump deal making, but rather the recognition by the Trump administration, to their credit, that factors on the ground have permanently changed. Now, Arab oil uh, producing states face both financial and social pressure. As revenue from oil declines, there's, a sufficient, uh, there's insufficient funds to pay a huge debt overhang. Much of this debt has been issued when, when oil was at $100 a barrel. Um, fund internal social services. Remember the way uh, the structure of, of most Arab um, economies is structured. Uh, the state uh, offers uh, uh, free education, free health care. That's money got to, you know, that money's got to come from someplace. Um, and at the same time, they need to provide funding to uh, the Palestinian Authority and other, uh, you know, uh, various nationalist groups. The decline in oil wealth means that Arab economies must reinvest, must reinvent themselves, which means that the massive domestic investment that must take place, Israel firms and their technological know-how offer the, the easiest, most productive way to achieve this. Now, at the same time, Arab investment dollars will find its way to Israeli firms. This will most likely occur indirectly at first, where Arab investors partnering with US and European investors form investment entities that invest directly in Israeli tech firms. Eventually, Israeli firms will be more uh, trusting and accepting Arab investments directly. As the process plays out, the regional economics and financial risk will diminish and the Israeli discount will disappear. <clears throat> now, of course, this is an hypothesis on our part that this happens, but the economics here is pretty, is, is, is pretty overwhelming. Now, <clears throat> Given, given this, given that there is a discount and the discount may go away, certainly over time, uh, this is a, a prime uh, time for company, US companies in the tech space, particularly mid-market firms that are not really uh, focused on Israel, should uh, refocus themselves and focus on Israel technology. And <clears throat> where should the US focus? Well, as the slide indicates, the biggest payoff for US firms is identifying startups that either advance the strategy of the current business and or offer an enabling technology. The closer the link to operational capabilities, the greater the payoff. So in this particular slide, the, it, it's basically the closer, uh, what an American company, for example, looks at an Israeli tech company, how close is that technology to leverage their operational capability? That, that's really the key question that needs to get answered. Now, th this is, by the way, this is the statement of uh, leverage and uh, in a technology that, it, that fits nicely or enables uh, operational capabil capabilities of, a, uh, of an American buyer. Uh, what research tells us, and this is uh, research done um, uh, on, on technology acquisitions, the complementarities may emerge not only uh, 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 from melding different areas of technical knowledge, but also from combining the target's technical knowledge with the buyer's manufacturing, marketing, sales, distribution capabilities. This all has to do with operational capability. Consistent with this logic, a recent study of long-term stock returns following technology acquisitions found that the interaction of the seller's R&D resources with the buyer's marketing resources has a positive effect on performance. This is a, 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 uh, a classic finding, it seems to me, and creates a, a, an opportunity, or should create an opportunity for firms to, uh, uh, that have not focused on, on Israeli technology, should be focusing on it now, precisely because the long-term returns to shareholders are likely to be higher as a result. Now, it's also true that buyers pursue technology acquisitions to obtain strategically valuable resources achieve market power, generate strategic renewal. Sellers uh, pursue acquisitions not only to obtain valuable resources, but also to relieve idiosyncratic personal pressures. Now, it, it, if, if one looks at uh, personal pressures of the sellers, the, uh, particularly the information asymmetries between buyers and sellers, particularly 
in the early in early stage companies. This is where uh, we think ABS can really help because we understand the relationship between information asymmetries and the relationship to value creation and value maximization. It's true that when one looks at the research in the technology area, whether it's Israeli tech companies, US tech companies, often when large buyers buy smaller firms, whether they're buying a segment of the smaller firm or buying the whole thing, there are uh, numerous areas where uh, there are disconnects. Often most of this is, is what I would consider information asymmetry, where the buyer uh, hasn't really uh, done their homework um, and the seller uh, may not have done their, their homework to the extent that they should. We can help here. Now, given this, the question now is how do you optimize the acquisition of a tech startup? So the first thing I'd like to do here is kind of share with you our experience in doing this. And that is, <clears throat> if you look at kind of the map of technology, a key to the acquisition of a, a tech startup is mapping its technology know-how to the technology of the acquirer. While this is common sense, one, one would be surprised how often this does not happen at a level necessary to increase the probability of creating commercial success. Some of the great failures of this include, if you look at some of the large ones, America Online and Time Warner, Google and Motorola, uh, Microsoft and Nokia, which is, which is, which is a huge one. And, and they're, they're, it, I wouldn't say these, these mistakes are endless, but they're very, very significant. And they're made often by large, uh, well-informed companies. And you have to ask yourself the question why that happens. Now, you should also consider uh, from a tech startup perspective, when one looks at it, um, what kinds of uh, startups or early stage, in Brian's term, seed funding, funding companies, wh where, do they, where do they sit? So what I wanna demonstrate is uh, here is that the probability of a successful acquisition, both from the perspective of the buyer and the seller, um, really require a certain level of sophistication and believe it or not, institutional funding for, on, on, the, on the seller side and um, a good deal of experience or uh, on, the, on, on, on the buyer side. So if you look at the stage of development uh, that, uh, that startups go, uh, you know, go through, there's uh, you know, project definition and there's the engineering stage, this construction stage, and then it comes to the startup stage. Now, when, when Brian talks about seed companies, I think most of the companies in his portfolio, and I'll leave Brian to, 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 uh, to indicate to me whether I made a mistake on this, uh, that, that, that those companies are, are, are really what I'll call startup. They, they've gone through uh, the engineering stage and the construction stage, but if you look at and this is not only Israeli companies, but if you look at startups from beginning to startup stage, the number of months, I mean, it's, it's somewhat, it's, it's close to five years. Um, so it takes a long time for a company to reach a certain maturation where it becomes a target, uh, an acquisition target, for an example, uh, for, for, for a larger company. Um, so one of the things that we do is when we look at <clears throat> companies that, that, uh, our clients want to acquire. There are a number of things that we that we look at. Well, obviously, the technology match is is one thing, um, but they're you know where are they in their development cycle? Are they truly very early stage, project definition, engineering stage, or they reach the startup stage? Number one, they've demonstrated some commercial some commercial viability. Now, if you look at uh, startups generally uh, and where the money comes from, uh, you can see it takes about five years to get at least the second round of institutional money. Now, this has been, this is the case historically. <clears throat> uh, my guess is now when I look at uh, the current environment that we're in, um, getting to the second round of financing is not going to take five years, particularly for a company that's that has prototypes and has shown some commercial viability. And if it has some revenue, that makes it even better, obviously. Uh, but <clears throat> more funding rounds, more exit options. <clears throat> now, this is a very interesting uh, slide, it seems to me, because it, it basically is just looking at companies where 
software as a service, which is uh, again kind of uh, an alignment with uh, with Israeli tech. And if you look at the total rounds <clears throat> uh, of, of funding from zero all the way to the left, and then the average years to exit, I think what you'll find is is that <clears throat> the if you look <clears throat> a company that has four rounds of institutional money and years to exit minimizes it about seven years. Uh, <clears throat> if you wait longer, that is if there are additional rounds of funding, it's obviously gonna take, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's gonna take, take us a longer time uh, to exit. Exit means <clears throat> either IPO or uh, a, strategic, a strategic purchase. So <clears throat> if you look at tech startups, if you're looking at a company <clears throat> or companies you want to purchase. The issues are, do tech, this technology, you know, is there an overlap? Um, how many rounds of financing do they have? Um, and how, and, and, whether, and whether prototypes and some commercialization has already occurred. Now, I think uh, Brian has mentioned that many companies in Israel are staying private. And with the attempt, of course, of, <clears throat> of uh, attempting to get larger using uh, uh, institutional money to grow to a certain size and, get, and, then getting a larger e and then getting a larger exit, which is certainly a sensible thing to do. Um, there are issues, of course, with uh, founders of, of technology companies and their resistance to even taking on additional uh, investment or certainly selling uh, in an exit, um, it, it's rarely an IPO, but it's usually it's usually an exit to a strategic buyer, and 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 the and, and the issue has to do with control versus value maximization. In many cases, certainly our experience, lots of owners, uh, every time you you mention an additional investment from the outside, namely institutional money, they cringe a little bit because they're concerned about control, and. Um, and when you and 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 the ones that actually kind of make it, the ones that that really see the light at the end of the tunnel, are the ones that have tremendous confidence in their in their in their particular capacity, either as a developer or as a manager or some combination, and they're not worried about giving up control because they are, are, are they are an asset to the company, and the buyer and the institutional investor kind of kind of recognizes that. They're the value maximizers. Um, if I go to the Israeli uh, merger and acquisition deals in the tech sector, I think Brian, Brian mentioned this early, earlier, I mean, or at least gave, <clears throat> noted it earlier. And then, you know, the, the, the numbers of deals between Israeli cross-border M&A deals uh, between the US and Israel have just skyrocketed. Um, and, and this is likely this this is this is likely to continue again because I, I think of a of a uh, of a more stable economic environment in 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 the Middle East number one and number two is lots of money around uh, globally uh, as Brian mentioned and more money is coming in particularly I'm guessing it'll, it will over time will be from from Arab investors the result of this will be that the uh, the discount, uh, the Israeli discount uh, for very valuable technology will begin uh, narrowing. Um, again, just to cover what, what, what Brian had mentioned, the number of the 10 largest sectors in U.S.-Israeli M&A deals, again, artificial intelligence, software as a service, cybersecurity, uh, obviously is, is th these are all enterprise for the most part. <clears throat> these are not, these are B2B uh, B2B applications. So before I move on, uh, let, let's talk about uh, the, let me summarize <clears throat> where we stand. Uh, the most successful acquisitions of startups, long-term returns are greater when the acquirer purchases a target whose technology either enables or complements the strategic objectives of the acquirer. Operational capability is anything, any technology that <clears throat> increases the operational capability of the acquirer is likely to be incredibly successful, uh, both from a purchase price perspective and from a shareholder return perspective. Israeli tech startups fit the long-term return profile because they look at strategic partners in order to scale. 
Um, they come here early, I think as Brian mentioned, they attempt to uh, create a, uh, a presence here in the US market, uh, again, for commercial reasons and also uh, for, uh, for talent reasons. Uh, talent releases unrelated to technology, more related to uh, marketing, sales, and in some cases, finance. Israeli startups come to the table with some level of institutional funding, which will become more available as a result of the Abraham Accords. And I said the Israeli discount will, will begin to disappear. Um, acquiring startups too early in their development is problematic. I think all of the research that we've done, the work we've actually done with startup companies, when the acquiring happens where the, where the tech company is, is too early in its development, there's often uh, large information asymmetries is the best way to describe it that result in a lower probability of success. A startup with multiple periods of financing, all else equal is likely to result in a successful acquisition relative to the identical firm, less dependent on institutional investors. So the institutional investor framework, aside from just capital, is also experience, networking, all the kinds of things that make a, an early stage company successful. And we often forget uh, the, the role that institutional investors play, their knowledge base and their, and their, and their networking. So let me, let me kind of get to the end of my presentation by talking about the acquisition game. Uh, T is considering, and, 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 and had, if, you're, if you're a tech startup, whether Israeli or US, and you're confronting um, uh, the, the acquisition of your company or considering another round of financing. How do you make that decision? Because many of the companies we're looking at uh, today are in this space. They're, they're, they're looking at, should we take another round of financing? As Brian said, get larger and then, and then, and then go for what I'll call the, the hit the home run, either the IPO or more likely the strategic exit. So let's consider this. So, uh, and then this is the kind of analysis that we do with our clients, but T is considering the fourth round of financing, institutional financing, I should say, and a subsequent IPO or, or exit. Strategic acquisition is less desirable since fear of culture clash and institutional investors believe that an IPO exit is value, is, uh, it, that is, is value maximizing. A wants to acquire T and needs to make a case for the acquisition. So here we are. Technology company is thinking, should we uh, get more money? Should we uh, go to an IPO or should we go through a strategic acquisition? So you have A make the case. And the answer I think is, is pretty straightforward by demonstrating the value, valuation possibilities are greater with a strategic acquisition than with a fourth round of finance, that fourth round of finance it would create. And so and that's, the, that's the actual question that needs, that needs to get answered. And of course, that is, uh, you know, the uh, proverbial 64, actually for $64,000, I say $64 million question. Um, but how do you answer that question? And, and that's, clients ask us that all the time. And um, we have used the methodology I wanna describe with, with clients uh, probably for the last 10 years. And, um, and it has to do with valuing an early stage tech company using something called Monte Carlo. And the Monte Carlo approach is the only method that is uniquely applicable to the valuation of early stage firm. And it's the method we, we use all the time. Why? Uh, because it considers thousands of outcomes that would impact the target and combines these randomly to create thousands of valuations and associated probabilities. So the one thing you need to know is, as I mentioned before earlier on, information asymmetries. Well, you know, that's a, that's a very, you know, uh, expressive term for a very set of complicated uh, issues, uh, internal issues, uh, uh, as well as, well, mostly internal issues. And then there's also these external risks. For example, you know, you have a, a very simply, you're, you're gonna integrate your technology to in one way or another with the products or services of the buyer. Well, how do you know that technology is actually gonna fit? How do you know that the market wants it? What happens if the market changes? What happens if the competitors come up with something different and better? Uh, these are all the issues, questions that, 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 that need to get addressed and, as, and become part of your analysis. Um, and so Avi, we asked the question, when should an early stage firm accept another round of financing or look to exit? 
In order to understand this, you really have to go through uh, what we call Monte Carlo, what is called Monte Carlo. And in order to demonstrate this, and, and the, 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 what I call the coup de grace actually, is if you look at, if you do the right kinds of analyses, that is, if you look at all the systematic risks that a tech company faces, as well as the buyer faces, if you look at the information asymmetries that are inherent in, in any technology acquisition, regardless of whether the buyer uh, is familiar with the technology or not, uh, these are all kinds of risk. I mean, there's so many of them and somehow you need to incorporate these into your analysis. And so what you see here is really the distribution of valuation of, of value, if you, if you will, and the probability of different values associated with this Monte Carlo. So it's not just, you know, three scenarios, high, low, and medium. There are thousands and thousands of valuation scenarios, all of which, uh, uh, or I should say thousands of, of possibilities, in fact, tens of thousands of possibilities, all giving us thousands of valuation implications. So the first, the, the, the blue that you see is, is um, the likely distribution of value as a result of uh, a fourth institutional funding, right? Um, and if you look at the distribution, if you look at the, what, what I call the expected value, it's in the neighborhood of about $50 million except it's telling you what the, what the probabilities are around 50. You know, you could be much lower, it could be much higher. And then there's the distribution of value if a strategic buyer buys you, and that's 80 million. Now, you would normally say that if somebody's willing to pay more than $50 million in, a, in, a, in an acquisition, I should do it, uh, all, else, all else equal. Uh, it's more than the 50 I think I can create on my own with institutional help. The strategic buyer uh, has got more resources, presumably, uh, but nevertheless is willing to pay a lot more money for it. Um, one would say, you know, if, uh, that 80 is greater than 50 and therefore, therefore we should do it. But we should look at this just a little closer. Not that, it's, not that the conclusion would change, but we look at it from a different perspective. And this is the cumulative distribution. And the, and the question is this, if we look at the $80 million, if, if, if you look at the $80 million number and then ask yourself the question, what's the probability that the value, that if things go right, the value will be greater than $80 million? Well, you know, in this particular case, which is an exercise we've done for a client, in this particular case, the probability that the value will be greater than 80 million is about a little over 40% based on the analysis we did. Well, uh, what, does this, what does this tell you? It means that the tech, it means that the tech company uh, might do a number of things. The, the one is it's, it's clear that the, the acquirer wants to spend $80 million, but from the perspective of the, of the, of the tech company, what does this tell you? Well, 80 is greater than 50. I also might, might, might suggest that the terms of the transaction might be a little different. Uh, maybe I want 80 and then participate somehow in anything over 80. From the shareholder perspective, that is the acquiring shareholder perspective, any valuation above 80 is creating additional value for shareholders. So this is the kind of analysis I think that's incredibly powerful because it allows both the buyer and the seller to, uh, to come to, to understand risks and opportunities uh, and uh, come to a conclusion where, where, where both make out. Both values created for both the buyer and the seller. It's not a zero sum game. In summary, Israeli and U.S. tech startup uh, ecosystems are very similar. The Israeli discount will disappear in large measure due to the uh, Abraham Accords and normalization between key Arab states and the Jewish state. New sources of outside funding will emerge that will significantly drive up acquisition, acquisition multiples. Now, this process that I talk about now has not been talked about much in the financial press, right? And I'm not suggesting for the moment that it's gonna happen tomorrow. What I'm suggesting is that the basic economics of what's going on in the Middle East has permanently changed. 
and it's permanently changed the advantage of, uh, uh, of both Arab, uh, Arab nations and the Jewish state. Uh, in addition, it creates tremendous opportunity for investors, particularly American investors in the Middle East. Given the new world, many Israel tech startups may choose to go it alone, as Brian, I think, has mentioned this, foreign funding to support scale in the U.S. rather than look to strategic acquirers, perhaps. The upshot is that the U.S. acquirers need to make the case that the going alone strategy has a smaller payoff than the strategic acquisition path, and we can help. Thank you very much. Any questions? So, uh, yes, yeah, so there are a couple questions here. We're sort of running out of time, but uh, there's a question for uh, Stan. What additional risk factors should be considered while evaluating Israeli companies compared to US companies? Uh, I mean, other than the ones I've, I've, I've mentioned, I, th I think the, the uh, the, the, the fact that the Israeli tech company is, uh, is, is in Israel, for one, um, uh, offers you know, some additional risk, I think. Uh, culture is, is a, you know, when, when, <clears throat> when acquisitions are done, the ones that are successful, that, that are really successful, um, or I should say the ones that fail, uh, or don't create as much value as you would hope, is usually, there's often a culture clash. Uh, uh, and and I, I think a lot of the a lot of the risks that we face uh, that acquisitions face are internal risks. They're not they're not outside risks. I think the outside risk uh, in the in the Middle East is uh, is has diminished uh, and will and will and will and will continue to diminish, uh, regardless of the which administration is uh, you know which dem which which political party is uh, is in power here in the, in the U.S. Um, but I think based on our experience. The biggest risks are often um, information asymmetries, not outside systematic risks. That's been our experience. Excellent. And so we have uh, a couple for uh, Brian here. Um, uh, one is while investing in Israeli companies, would there be any cultural challenges that you have to worry about? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, doing doing business in you know any new country comes with its cultural challenges, um, and you just have to know uh, what to look out for, how to protect yourself, how to protect your investors, uh, you know, how to uh, effectively position yourself for um, you know a, a positive outcome from a terms perspective, from a protective provisions perspective, from a uh, a, a corporate governance perspective. Um, but yes, there, there are, you know, to, to think that one can just walk into, you know, a, a, a boardroom in Tel Aviv and start conducting business as they would in Boston or, or Palo Alto, um, that's, that's, that's inaccurate. So yes, there are, there are cultural challenges. Uh, thank you. And one last one, because we're running out of time. Uh, for Brian, what is the best way for someone new to the Israeli tech sector to become more educated about it? Sure. So there's a lot of so there's a couple of um, of news sources. So there's a a, a, a newspaper called Kalkalist, C A L C A L I S T, Kalkalist. Um, they have an English publication that covers Israel's business world. Um, there's also a uh, a news publication called um, Globes, Globes Business, uh, specifically designed for Israel's tech ecosystem. Um, and then there's a bunch of databases that you can kind of pay attention to. Uh, one is called Startup Nation Central. They've got a free database that you can access to kind of get a sense for what's going on in Israel. Um, and then there's a whole array of Hebrew publications. Uh, 